Hello, this is Mark Ross. I'm the uh, Communication Director for the U.S.-China Business Council. I want to thank you for joining today's China Business Review webinar. We've got a very interesting program ahead of us. Uh, we're going to be discussing uh, web access in China, specifically demystifying China online and steps you can take to reach your audience with your website and cloud applications in China. It's not surprising, obviously, China is one of the world's largest and fastest growing online populations, and, continue, and China continues to attract a global online business of all industries. Internet censorship, and unreliable infrastructure, and complex web content licensing requirements, however, make it difficult to enter China and deliver effective websites. But today we've got two experts who are going to help, uh, help you learn how to better execute and better perform online in China. Joining us today is Kellen Willis. Uh, she's an associate analyst covering Asia-Pacific online consumer behavior at Forrester. And Jeff Kim, who's the president and CEO of CD Networks US and EMEA. In this webinar, specifically, they will explore online opportunities presented by the China web market, web performance and regulatory challenges in reaching China web users, solutions for overcoming web performance challenges, and finally, how to fulfill regulatory requirements mandated by several Chinese regulatory agencies. Quick housekeeping before I turn it over to our speakers. If you have any problems, simply submit a question, and one of our technical reps will address it. Uh, both speakers will uh, go through the slide deck, we'll, and we'll finish up with a Q&A session. So if you have questions anytime during the session, simply visit the uh, Q&A module on your screen, type in the question, and hit submit. Finally, uh, if you're interested in the slide deck, I can make that available via PDF at the end of the session. Just simply send me an email to mross, M-R-O-S-S, -S, at uschina.org. Okay, so no more housekeeping. I'm going to turn it over to uh, Kellen, who is joining us live from Singapore. Hi, and thank you so much for making the time to join this webinar today. I just want to make sure before I go forward, Mark, um, are, am I on the right slide right now? Do you see the opportunities slide? Yes. Okay, great. So first I want to start off by just mentioning that China is home to the world's largest online population. And this presents a huge opportunity for international businesses to access a whole new body of online consumers that they wouldn't be able to have access to without digital trends. When you look at the, the sheer numbers, the online population in China, it's absolutely mind-boggling. So by 2015, more than 700 million Chinese are going to have regular access to the Internet. And you see that that number is going to grow to 760 million by the end of 2017. So it's really important for any, any business to think about how they're going to reach and how they're going to have a presence in China today. Just to give you a little bit of perspective around how the online market or how online shoppers in China compare to those across the rest of the globe, there are 75 million more online shoppers in China than there are in the U.S., double the number of online shoppers in Japan, and six times the number of online shoppers in the UK. And the reason that I highlight the, the US, Japan, and UK here is because those are three markets that are traditionally considered to be very advanced e-commerce markets. And as this graph will show you, there are more internet users in China today than there are people in the US. And by 2016, you're going to have an online, online penetration of about 50% across all of China. What's most interesting, though, if you look at this slide, is the number of mobile subscribers, which is showing that online access is going to be happening across not only the desktop, but also the mobile device, just meaning that consumers are going to expect to have access to information across all touch points at any given time. Of course, something that's really unique, it's interesting about this market, is that these consumers are extremely social online. 
So what you see here is that not only are they using social media channels to discover new products, to explore new products and brands, but also to engage with consumers. And you see that the online market in China is one of the most active when it comes to not only reading ratings and reviews, but also leaving ratings and reviews. You see on a large number, you see a large number of online shoppers who are shopping on the major marketplaces like a Tmall, for example, they, t they make time and they take the time to leave very excessive product feedback. And this all comes down to the idea that these are very active netizens and they're using the internet not only to explore new products, but also to help them guide their, their purchasing decisions. And like I was saying, the majority of the population has access to the internet and they're also using it. 78% of online users in metropolitan areas are using the internet at least monthly. 80% of them in metropolitan areas have broadband connection at home, which is vastly different from a market like India, for example. You also see that these online shopping habits in China are absolutely unprecedented for an emerging market or what, what Forrester would still consider an ascending market. So you see that 85% of online consumers in metropolitan areas in China have actually made a purchase online in the past three months. And these purchasing behaviors are very different from those in the U.S. You see that across the board, average order values tend to be higher, conversion rates for online brands and retailers tend to be higher. And what's really interesting is that consumers are shopping across categories. So in a market like um, South Korea, for example, another, you know, one of the Asia Pacific neighbors of China, online shoppers in that region tend to buy consumer electronics, some of those more comparable goods, which makes it a more immature e-commerce landscape whereas online shoppers in China are buying across categories. They're not only thinking about buying clothing and accessories, they're also buying things like skincare. And something that I think is really interesting to note when it com comes to online behavior in China is that you see on, um, both male and female online shoppers tend to have a very similar online shopping habits. So the skincare category in China is very popular for both ma the male and female demographic. Whereas in Japan, it's very popular for the female demographic, but not so popular for the male demographic. Just to give you an idea of the, the vast size of the online market in China, you can see here that online retail sales in 2013 surpassed that of the U.S. They're much bigger than those in Japan and South Korea and India and Australia and even a, a very ma another very mature market like the UK. This is just to show you a little bit of a breakdown of the growth of e-commerce revenue, online retail spend in China. And like I said, by the end of 2014, it is already far surpassed that of the U.S. And this is in terms of sheer online retail spend. The numbers can actually directly be compared to those of the U.S. online, online retail market because for, Forrester, for its China forecast, looks at both B2C and C2C sales, whereas in the U.S. it only looks at B2C sales. And one of the reasons that we include C2C in the China forecast is that it makes up such a large part of the online retail market in China today. A few other drivers of the online retail market in China today include a number of online pure plays, which are predominantly the Alibaba group, big players, for example, Tmall and Taobao. You also see a number of international brands like an Amazon doing really well in China. But for the most part, this online retail spend that, that is in the B2C market share is driven by local domestic online pure plays. What I think is really interesting to note, though, is that China is getting to the stage where it's moving away from this marketplace and auction-based um, online shopping habits, and they're starting to think about engaging directly with a brand. You actually see in, an, in a number of surveys that those more mature online shoppers in China 
are really interested in, in engaging directly with the brand, either through their website or through another digital channel. So they would much prefer to buy, for example, from um, an UggsAustralia.cn than, than they would buy from a third-party international distributor. Forrester uses something called the e-commerce readiness index to measure e-commerce maturity across markets around the globe. And what's really interesting to note here is that China ranks second. And it's, as you can see, it, it's far below, it scores far lower than that of the U.S. But one of the reasons that it scores so high, and even higher than a market like the U.K. or Germany, is because of the vast retail opportunity that's available here in addition to the really large online population, which also helps it score higher than a market like Japan or South Korea. But the two areas where China is lacking is in um, merchant capabilities, which we also consider, call vendor, vendor support. So just the number, of on, uh, the number of international brands that are actually selling online in China, also the number of local brands that have migrated to an online, online service in China, and the second area where China is falling short is infrastructure. This comes down to general access to broadband, general access to 3G and 4G networks on mobile devices, and just the overall penetration of, of the Internet across the region. So despite the fact that the online population is actually quite massive, the penetration is still much lower in China than it is in the U.S. today. And last but not least, I just want to explain to you that mobile is something that's absolutely critical to driving some of this e-commerce growth in the region. So you see that in metropolitan areas, 82% of consumers are accessing the Internet on their mobile phone at least daily. 88% of mobile phone owners are using smartphones, which gives them more opportunities to access the internet and access digital content. You also see that online shoppers and online consumers in metropolitan areas in China are using the, are using the internet to start to think about their finances. While 80% are using online banking on a PC, 34% of them are using are using their mobile devices for banking capabilities. Not that this might resonate with you directly if you're not a financial institution, but the important thing to think about here is that online shoppers in metropolitan China are starting to use these devices for more advanced activities. Now, of course, this can't just be a great story about all these opportunities and that you should rush into the market because there are absolutely a number of really significant challenges that come along with executing any successful business in China. To share with you some of what we hear from our clients, we hear them saying that operational challenges in China are not intuitive, that you absolutely need local relationships to survive, and that when you're thinking about launching a business in China, you shouldn't treat it as an extension of the business that you're already operating in the U.S. or in Europe, but also as a completely separate entity. Which means, of course, that it's very important to have local partners when entering this market. A number of challenges that come along with ho hosting content in China all come down to the Great Firewall of China, which is one of the most excessive government infrastructures for monitoring, for monitoring digital content. It's extremely advanced. And what it does is it blocks 97% of international routers and 3% of internal routers are blocked. The government also allows for preferential treatment from agency to agency. So if you're not working with the right agency at the right time, if you're hosting your content from China, there may be grounds for blocking your content. It might be temporary, it could be inconsistent, and it's very likely that you'll have absolutely no idea why it happened. 
Additionally, any domain can be subject to being blocked, whether it's hosted from within China or outside of China. Just to give you an example, over 2,500 foreign domains are blocked in China today. And of course, that includes some of the biggest and most used websites in the States, for example, Facebook and Twitter. And of course, last but not least, and this is probably one of the most important if you're, if you're um, offering some type of transactional capability through your website in China, is just the lag and load time. We find that it takes an additional 10 to 15 per second 10 to 15 seconds when accessing a website in China. And we see a number of estimates putting this at around a 30 to 40 percent cart abandonment rate. And just to give you an idea of how slow the lag time is in China, you see that the average response time takes over seven seconds in China compared to a market like Brazil, another one of the brick markets, which, which doesn't even take seven seconds, or in the U.S. where you're still at under three seconds. Something that consumers in China have done to get around this, although this isn't the most convenient form of accessing content, is to use link-saturated sites. And you see a number of content providers offering this type of user interface. So what they tend to do is go to a website, look at the headlines or you know, the product detail pages that they might want to engage with later, and open up a large number of tabs. And I used to live in China, and I would see my colleagues engaging in this exact behavior. And what you do is you open up a large number of tabs and let all the pages load while you look at the page that has already loaded. This is kind of a workaround for the online consumer in China to not have to wait for those extremely long lead times. And like I was saying, for web content that's hosted outside of China, performance challenges are even bigger. So the response time for a typical web page that's being hosted outside of China, being hosted from the US or the EU, takes anywhere from 20 to 30 seconds. Another reason for this, the extreme discrepancy in the amount of time that it takes to load a page in China is because of this great divide between the North and the South. So in the Northern China, you have this Unicom territory. In Southern China, you've got the Telecom territory. And what this does is create the fragmented market, forcing, forcing online businesses to mirror their sites from ISPs in both, both locations. Another one of the major issues is that nearly 50% of internet users in China are in rural areas. And of course, in a rural area, the internet connection is going to be much slower than that in a metropolitan area. In addition to that, in addition to being slow, it's very unreliable. And a lot of consumers are accessing the internet from something like this picture would depict, which is an internet cafe. They're accessing the internet on older computers. So the key takeaway being, to whatever extent you can, it's absolutely critical to host your content in a way that it's going to be delivered to the consumer in as fast of a way as possible, because there are already a number of, bar of barriers to entry in this market. One of the other barriers is the licensing requirements, which can be a major barrier to entry when you're actually hosting a website within China. So you see that the Record Bureau and the Public Security Bureau have to give you a license, which is required for all websites that are hosted and delivering from within the Great Firewall borders within China. If you're going to have a shopping cart on your site, you must have an ICP license. And then a number of additional licenses may be required depending on the sector that you're operating in. Of course, getting these licenses takes a large amount, it takes a long time, and like I was mentioning, it's very subjective. Just to give you an example, this is fast retailer's brand, Uniqlo. It's a picture of their website, very site dense, or um, link dense, um, gives the consumers a lot of opportunities to open up a number of tabs, and you see here in the red box highlighted their ICP number. 
And when you look a little bit deeper into their ICP number, it's pretty interesting to see that not only does Uniqlo.cn have to have a registered ICP, but Uniqlo.com and FastRetailing.com also have to be included in this ICP license, which only further slows down the time to receiving the license. Just to give you an idea of the type of content that's very difficult to host in China and the type of content that's easier to host in China, of course, things like adult content, political topics, and religious con topics are very likely to be blocked. Whereas enterprise software, e-commerce, and entertainment sector aren't as likely to be blocked. But that said, it still requires it's still going to take a long time for the consumers in those markets to access your content if it's hosted outside of China. So what options, options do businesses that are interested in hosting a website for the Chinese consumer have? Well, one thing that we see businesses do is they move their content closer to the greater China area. This usually means hosting the content from Singapore or Hong Kong. But of course, the big issue is, with this is that you're still outside the borders of the Great Firewall. Which means that it's still going to take, it's still going to um, create a delay of about 550 milliseconds. And of course, one of the other limiting factors is that you still have this firewall filtering. In addition to that, choosing a hosting provider outside of the Great Firewall can be tricky. And like I mentioned, that sites hosted on the same server or at the same IP block as other questionable content, the types of content that we just went over, could also be blocked, causing your content to be blocked within the Great Firewall. Another option for hosting content is to host it within mainland China. So this is an option that we've already explored. And I talked to you about some of the limitations with this option, which is just come, which co really comes down to creating local partnerships, uh, acquiring those licenses, and a better understanding the local landscape, which can take years and be very expensive. And then again, you have this issue of your hosting within China that comes down to the northern China and southern China territories, which means that you're going to have to create mirrored sites in both territories to overcome the sparse bandwidth. It's a very complex operation, and it means that businesses are going to have to apply for government-issued licenses. The rules and regulations are going to be very confusing and subjective. And you also are going to likely have to set up local operations. And thirdly, the option that, that businesses interested in hosting online in China is to host externally but using a content delivery network within China. In this case, when using a content delivery network, it's absolutely critical that there's geographic coverage. So just to review the amount of time that it's going to take using these um, different options. So if you don't do anything, it's going to take about three seconds. That's for a single ob object, for the single object to load. If you host close to China, it takes about 450 milliseconds. Within China, it can take anywhere from 10 to 300 milliseconds, depending on the type of license that you have and the type of business license that you have. But if you use something like a content delivery network acceleration, that's, only, that's going to drastically reduce the amount of time that it takes for a single object to load. Not only that, but the efforts are much, much lower because you're outsourcing all of the all of the legwork, all of the grunt work of acquiring licenses and developing those local partnerships to the company that is hosting the CDN. And of course, 
the return on investment is going to be much quicker because the time to implementation is just that much quicker. That said, there are still some things that you must think about if you're going to go with the content delivery network partner when you're working in China. You've got to think about whether or not their local coverage is broad enough. They've got to think about the north and south divide, they've all, but they've also got to deliver strong performance across the country in both the north and the south. They've got to have local know-how and expertise. That means they've got to understand what type of licenses you're going to need and what agencies to work with. And then they've got to have the local relationships to actually execute on those needs that you may have. Additionally, it's absolutely critical that this content delivery network is going to have content that is going to be able to deliver content both in China and also outside of China. It's also, I also strongly advise you to question whether or not your content delivery network has some type of global know-how because a mature business is going to require a partner that understands the way that a multinational company works and how process, what the processes look like and how things are done. And then again, global management. Having a content delivery network provider that has local offices in China is going to help you better execute your online operations in that, in that market. And last but not least, it's also really important to think about how this CDN is going to help you optimize your content on a mobile platform. And what this will do is really, it's not that it's going to actually host the content in a way that makes it easier to access on the mobile device, but what it should do is compress images and page structure based on the current network conditions in the market. So in China, for example, that's going to be largely 3D, which will help online consumers on that device, on their mobile devices, access the content as quickly as possible. So the important thing to remember here is that you have a number of options. Depending on what your goals in China are, it's critical to think about which option is going to best meet your needs and what type of local partnerships you're going to create in order to meet those goals that you have as a business. And with that, I'll hand it over to Jeff. Thank you, Kellen. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, uh, this is Jeff Kim. I'm the President and Chief Operating Officer for CD Networks, uh, US and EMEA. Um, Kellen provided a, a, a lot of information. I, I'm just going to kind of highlight and focus on uh, some of the things that uh, she, she's already covered. So a, a bit about CD Networks, we are a global content delivery network. Uh, we have been in around since uh, 2000, so we're about 14 years old. Um, we uh, help over 40,000 websites around uh, the world to uh, accelerate and deliver their content. We have 140 points of presence or you know, data center locations with thousands of servers around the globe. Uh, we have 25 points of presence specifically in China, and we really focus on performance, security, scalability for our customers. Um, we've been operating in China since 2006, and our primary focus actually hasn't been in, in uh, providing CDN services for uh, our, our mainland China customers. It's actually been uh, extending uh, customers in the U.S., in EMEA, Japan, and Korea into China. So we've been doing this the longest. Um, I would say that uh, about in 2009 or 10, uh, when I was kind of evangelizing and, and, and um, meeting with customers about this, uh, a lot of the customers were just in early research mode and, you know, should we extend our business into China? And here we are in 2014. It's not a should question anymore. It's a, it's a how. And, uh, you know, my kind of reference point from the crossing the chasm, we're, we're kind of in the later stages of the early adopters. And soon we'll, we'll cross over into uh, uh, into the late majority. So the question of extending your web presence, your web business, uh, whatever industry you're in, it, it's not again a should. It's it's a how do we do it, and, and it's an imperative that you, that you get in. Um, 
Uh, I'll cover a little bit more about the company and our products and, and also highlight one of our uh, customers. There's some logos down at the bottom. Uh, again, we have uh, you know thousands of customers. Uh, a lot of them are customers that we've extended into China or Russia or other hard-to-reach areas uh, across all sorts of different verticals. Uh, a, a little bit about what Kellen already covered. Uh, there's a, a, a single test object. So this is a 64 kilobyte object. So you know it, this could be an image. This could be something else on, on your website. Um, and from two different locations. One's in uh, Guangzhou, inside of China, and one's from Hong Kong, outside of uh, China. And geographically, they're about the same, I think the same dif distance from uh, Beijing. But you can see that the red line, it takes more than two, 2.5 seconds to load this one object from outside of China, whereas uh, with, with, uh, from Hong Kong, for, but from within it takes uh, you know, closer to one second. So imagine that multiplied by you know, the 30, 40 objects or uh, you know, the paid, uh, objects that you need to download for a whole website. Um, if you don't know what your end user experience uh, it, within China is, that first and foremost is something that you need to find out. So you can contact us, you can contact some other uh, uh, you know, companies out there like Keynote or Gomez or China uh, or Network Bench within China. Um, and the, the first thing you need to do is f to figure out what are your end users seeing when they log on to your, your portal or your website or, or your enterprise CRM. Um, and most likely what we found is that um, it's taken them 20, 25 seconds to, to load your page. Um, and uh, uh, a lot of, uh, of our uh, customers are quite surprised by that. Um, so, um, I mean, just jump into the end. I mean, here in the U.S. or in Europe, you know, we help a lot of customers to get their load pages from like seven seconds down to three seconds, which is quite significant. But when you show uh, a customer that we can get them down from 25 seconds down to, to four seconds, that's uh, extraordinary. And, and that makes, a, you know, your investment in your, in your ERP system, your investment in your retail or commerce, uh, the millions that you, you've spent, totally worthwhile. Uh, uh, because now, now your 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 presence is uh, or your website is is usable. Okay, uh, typical typical graph. Uh, I think this one basically says, hey, you, the, the the website or your your application is hosted in London, and guess what? It takes less than one second for your end users in London to access your page. But the farther you get away from um, uh, from your data center uh, and all the way to the right, I'm sure it's China or Russia. Um, it's getting slower and slower. And uh, one of the things I love telling uh, our folks, our customers, is that this is not a bandwidth problem. Um, and even if, uh, you know, a lot of people think, oh, I just need to add more bandwidth, or the end users in, in China and Russia just need more bandwidth. Absolutely false. Um, there's a white paper on our website where we can basically mathematically show you that it's not a bandwidth problem. Um, and, and the math problems when you typically take it to infinity even if you had infinite bandwidth, um, you would still see this issue, and that's because uh, of uh, the inherent flaws in, uh, in TCP IP, which the Internet is based off of. Um, and, uh, you know, the TCP IP was originally designed and created in 1973, uh, and it was never designed to use, uh, be used in such a manner that we're using it today, and yet we've built our entire, uh, you know, Internet world on it. And so what we do is kind of overcome some of the inherent flaws uh, of, uh, of what, what was originally designed. Um, okay, so why does this all matter? So uh, Kellen uh, gave you a lot of facts about milliseconds, and I'm giving you the same thing, you know, millisecond this, millisecond that. Well, what, what does that really matter? Um, well, there's some facts there, and actually Walmart, if you go do a search on Walmart performance, they have a, an absolutely fantastic web paper um, that you should – you should be looking at. Um, it means that milliseconds matter. Um, and you'll see a quote there from Google and Amazon and, and Shopzilla. Basically, the net net is, you know, ten, you know tens, hundreds of milliseconds, um, you know, the, the blink of an eye. Uh, it, they can directly correlate that to increased revenue, uh, decreased uh, customer complaints. Um, so there's massive amounts of information out there that say the longer they, your end users have to wait, the, the uh, the unhappier they are and the less likely they are to buy or to use the application. Um, and then compound that. So I just told you about, you know, the 20 seconds that a PC end user um, uh, takes to, to access an application. In the mobile world, multiply that by three. Um, um, so, I mean, even in Europe or the U.S., we're still seeing mobile uh, load times of, of, you know, 13, 14 seconds. 
Um, that, that's on average for a lot of uh, customers that we see. And that's just because that's where the PC world used to be, you know, five, ten years ago. Well, now that's where the mobile world is. Well, but that basically means that your mobile end users that are lo log launching or logging in from China, your, your, app, your application is unusable. Uh, it will time out. Um, so, you know, th that's the reality of the situation, and that's why, uh, you know, customers and folks are, you know, coming to, uh, to us and uh, to, to, uh, to find out more information. The graph on the right, we have a social gaming customer that went live with us that launched uh, 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 within China, and you can see, again, the faster that, they, uh, that we made their, their website, their application, um, their traffic grew uh, significantly. So, um, you know, th that's the reality of and this type of graph is actually quite typical for a lot of uh, the customers that we serve. All right, so just to highlight um, some of the things that Kellen already covered, most of the time when we walk into uh, any vertical, uh, whether it's insurance or travel or finance or, uh, you know, an airline or a luxury brand, uh, they're typically the IT department or the web infrastructure department are typically, typically thinking of uh, these three options. And the first and foremost, the biggest one is always add more data centers, okay? So our end users are, uh, we, we finally detected that our performance in China is poor, so what do we do? Let's go add a data center. Uh, and that's what, um, uh, they, we, you know, the IT departments and web uh, infrastructure departments have been doing for the past t 5, 10, 15 years, so why not? Um, this will absolutely not solve the problem. Um, and as uh, uh, we've already covered, um, China does not equal Beijing. It does not equal Shanghai. It does not equal another metro center. Uh, we have 25 points of presence in China, and that's barely enough, and we keep trying to increase our infrastructure there just to get better performance. Okay, so adding a single data center, it uh, not only uh, makes it makes your replication of, of uh, your data center or application much harder, um, but it won't solve your performance problem. The second thing is hardware appliances. So there are companies like you know, Riverbed, Blue Coat, uh, Cisco, uh, you know, that will sell you hardware. And actually, they work quite well in a one-to-one -one environment. So if you have a branch office or, a, you know, a single factory location or a, a, things of that nature, um, that's what those hardware devices were built for. But as soon as you have end users or uh, mobile workforces or uh, nomadic uh, kind of, uh, you, know, uh, uh, you know, end users logging in from all over the place, you can't put a hardware device everywhere. Um, that's kind of what we've done. Um, um, so that doesn't solve the problem either. And then thirdly, tra tra traditional CDNs. Um, so the content delivery network space started a long time ago, and it started off with caching. And what that basically means is we'll take uh, the, the objects that are not dynamic, that are um, you know uh, logos and images and audio files and video files that, uh, uh, that are accessed by many people, and we'll go ahead and store them locally. Um, and that's how our kind of industry began. Well, uh, most, of, most CDNs still practice in that kind of mode. And we, we, do, uh, we, we also have a lot of caching customers. But applications these days are truly dynamic. They're one-to-one. -one. They're, they're my, you know, they're my uh, trade. They're, they, you know, they're my, it's my shopping basket. Uh, very specific. Um, and uh, most of the CDNs out there do not um, uh, have this kind of uh, ability to, to accelerate dynamic content, which I'll talk about in a second. Okay, so what do we offer? Um, and, uh, you know, how do we overcome the, 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 or how are we different from the options that I just covered? So, to just reemphasize, 25 points of presence in, in China. Um, we are in-country experts in contenting, content licensing and regulations. We actually spend a lot of time, not just on the technical infrastructure, but we actually act as agents on behalf of our customers to get them the appropriate licenses. Um, so, uh, you know, it, you know it, it, the, the Bayon license that uh, uh, we have already covered, that absolutely needs to be at the footer of your website, um, or, um, you know, it will, your site will get blocked from within China. Um, so we, we'll go ahead and, and work with you um, to go to, to the right boards and lo locations to uh, file the, the right applications. And, and then on top of that, uh, we're always monitoring. So. Um, you know, if something happens, one of the biggest things here is that, that the, the, you know, um, the MIT and the other, the PSB, the other uh, ministries within China, they just want someone local to contact in, 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 uh, in case something goes wrong. And they do not want to call into San Jose or, or, 
or you know, or uh, you know, the, the D.C. area to, to find someone. So they want to call someone local um, and say, hey, something's wrong with your site, and then if you can remedy it, it's fine. So it, it's more of the being being reachable and responsive, and that's what we found. Um, so over the years, you know, some of our customers have gotten you know blocked or something has happened, and uh, by having a 24 by 7 support team that, are, that is well versed in, in, in all of this, uh, we can easily and quickly remedy it before it escalates into something uh, that's unfixable. Um, and that's kind of the value that we, that we offer. And of course, I've already kind of uh, covered the technology in this next slide. So uh, typically without someone like us, what would happen um, is We, uh, what we basically do is, uh, it, without us, um, let's say your, your origin, your data center is located uh, on the East Coast here in Virginia. Uh, that end user would have to traverse the internet through the firewall and then um, you know, uh, get the content from Virginia and crawl all the way back. What we actually do is, by having local pops and servers within China, your end users are getting routed to one of our servers. And of course, the cacheable content, the logos, the JPEGs, the, the audio and video will get served locally there. Uh, but the dynamic pieces, the shopping cart, the, 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 the real-time financial trade uh, that needs to go through, um, we, by having a, 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 a pop close to your web data center and close to the end user, we actually create a fast kind of secure tunnel over the Internet. And what we do is, is we overcome those inherent uh, flaws or problems that, we, that I discussed on TCP. Um, so we're kind of creating a, a kind of a super, super highway that allows uh, transport to come much faster. Um, does that really work? I'll tell you a case study that, uh, that's on our website. Uh, a company, uh, one of our customers called Saxo Bank, they do uh, foreign exchange trading. So it's the whole, um, you know, I'll, I'll buy a dollar for, you know, you know, you know, one British pound. And end users in China would click the button to, to make that trade. And because of the additional milliseconds, uh, when their uh, request got back to the, the data center, which is in Denmark, the, the price had changed. Um, so. Uh, the, the trades would fail. Um, so we're talking, we're not talking about, you know, one or two seconds, we're talking about within milliseconds these, these uh, currencies are trading, uh, are changing so that the trades would fail. Well, with our uh, services, um, those trades started going through. And of course, you know, that, that saved or got them millions of dollars in, in successful trades where they weren't seeing that before. Um, but that same application could be used on your shopping cart um, or, or, you know, uh, you know your your travel site, um, uh, you know, or your you know your your back end uh, customer relationship management system or supply chain management system. So um, you know, that's kind of what we offer uh, to to our customers. Uh, already kind of covered this, but uh, um, basically, if you don't go with uh, a, a CDN or some type of solution, um, you will see your end users will see 20, 25, 35 seconds for a, a website to load, and uh, we can typically get that down to somewhere between five and 10 seconds um, uh, from within China. So uh, quite, a, quite a, a real ROI. Okay, uh, just to uh, finish things off with uh, one case study, so Bally is a luxury brand that we, we serve. The opportunity there, of course, is you know, uh, the, the overall market, not just for Bally, but just the overall market, 27% of all luxury goods is consumed by China, uh, Chinese shoppers. And by next year, 35% uh, of all luxury goods uh, will be sold there. Um, so Bally launched uh, their, their website, Bally.cn, in 2011. Um, uh, uh, but it, it wasn't functioning as well as they wanted it to. And they needed support with local regulations and poor web performance um, and, uh, you know, uh, better um, stable kind of uh, performance from all of the different cities and, and towns and rural areas. So they went live with our services, and we reduced their uh, load time by 81%, which is quite significant. And so um, uh, I encourage you, when you're in China, go and try logging on to valley.cn, and I'll, I can uh, assure you that it's probably one of the fastest sites that, uh, that you'll see uh, within, within country. Okay, uh, that concludes it for, for, for me. Um, let me turn it over back to uh, to Mark. Perfect. <clears throat> Jeff and Kellen, thank you very much. A very insightful, great overview. A uh, lot there to process. As I said at the beginning of the session, if you would like to ask a question, 
of our two presenters. Simply type in the question and hit submit, and I will get it queued up. We've got a few coming in. Um, so, and we've got about 10 minutes left here to take some questions. So, uh, why don't we start this first one here for you, Kellen? Um, you know, online retail spending, right? Obviously, going up, a lot of positive trend lines. Uh, a lot of exciting growth, but why the growth? I mean, obviously there's a big population, but is it is it the technology? Is it the ease? Um, are the brick and mortars, you know, brick and mortar retail experience poor? Is it a novelty? Is it cool? I mean, why are we seeing so much online retail? I think that there's that's a great question, and there are a number of answers, which makes the marketplace in China unique. So one of the reasons is that you're starting to – right now, the retail opportunity is still untapped. So you see a lot of brick-and-mortar retailers that have yet to go online, have yet to offer an online experience. And as they start to migrate to the online experience, you're going to see online spend increase. You also see today that the majority of online spend in China, in terms of sheer dollars, is coming from metropolitan areas, which is likely due to the fact that – um, like what Jeff was saying, that this, these metropolitan areas are where the Internet is just the easiest, is the most accessible, it's the fastest. It's also where these consumers have the most access to the Internet, to 3G, to broadband, to Wi-Fi. But as the country develops into more, into the um, lower tier cities, like the tier three, tier four cities, you're going to have a large population that currently doesn't have steady access to the Internet, that's going to start to have access to the Internet. And what's really interesting to note is that you, as you do see this migration of um, Internet access to some of these lower-tiered cities, the actual percentage of their take-home spend that is spent online is higher than that of what's spent online in metropolitan areas. So I think that's what's really going to fuel the e-commerce growth going forward over the next few years. Also contributing to that is that you see a number of international brands starting to really develop their e-commerce experience online in China, whether or not it's a brand like Bali, which you know traditionally hasn't offered an online experience in China up to date um, in the luxury sector, or you know it's it's a more it's a lower end brand, or even it's a consumer products goods brand. Perfect. Uh, Jeff, this is uh, – I'm going to combine two questions here. Um, obviously, it was stressed throughout the presentation the importance of uh, acquiring the necessary licenses to operate. Um, can you discuss best – you touched on it a little bit, but can you talk about best practices going through that process? And then uh, it was mentioned there are nearly 2,500 foreign brands or foreign domains that are blocked in China. How would one know if their site is blocked in China? Sure, I, I can address the first one. Uh, so Kellen touched on it briefly. I'll, I'll just highlight it uh, a little bit. Um, there are actually two, well, there are actually several licenses, but I'll, I'll cover the, the top two. There's something called an ICP license, and that is if you have a shopping cart on your website um, and you are uh, clearing some kind of financial transaction, uh, you need this thing called an ICP license. Um, and in order to get that, you need a local Chinese entity uh, within China, you know, your own, uh, you, know, uh, uh, you know, incorporated company, people, all, all of that. Um, and that's basically because financial settlement is, is, is happening. Separate from that, um, and, and that really comes down to, you know, financial settlement, so ICP license. The second one is called a Bayon license. Now, it, it's often confused with the first one because um, it's actually called an ICP Bayon license. Um, but I, I, so a lot of our customers are confused about the two. But for, for ease of uh, sake, we, we just call it simply a Bayon. Even though when you look at it at the footer of a website, you will see ICP right before before it. Um, that Bayon license uh, is completely different from the first one. And what that basically says is you have the right to deliver website content pages to the citizens of China. Um, so um, uh, every website has to have a Bayon but not every website has to have an ICP license, the first one, okay? So what we help um, our customers with is, is definitely is, is first and foremost getting that Bayon license. 
and there's a specific application form that goes into naming who the appropriate contacts are, and if there's an issue, who are they going to contact, and, and we actually act uh, for our customers as their proxy or, or their uh, registration vehicle. So if, uh, if something goes wrong with their website, they contact uh, our offices in China, and then we, of, of course, take the appropriate actions and contact our customers. Um, and then the third thing, which I won't go, go into very specific uh, much more, there, is, uh, there are industry licenses um, that are very specific to the, the, the appropriate ministry. So if you're in online education and, or you're in agriculture or you're in you know, whatever industry, there are separate licenses that you need to get uh, uh, there as well. Um, so we kind of uh, advise our customers and, and clients on, on, on the entire landscape and not just the, of course, the CDN technology uh, elements of it. Uh, the, the second question um, was, I'm sorry, what was the second question? Yeah, the, just how would, would one know if your site is blocked, if your domain, your foreign domain is blocked? Sure. Um, there's actually a website. I, I forget what's that called. Am I blocked or – Kellen, do you, do you know that that site? Yeah, that's actually one of the most popular sites for businesses that aren't operating from within China to, to figure out whether or not their site is blocked. Because there's no other way to know unless you proactively go and search using this website. There you go, uh, blockedinchina.net. So that's one, uh, one way of, of finding out. Um, that's probably the easiest one. Um, and then there's, of course, uh, um, um, you can actually go to the, the testing places like that we talked about ourselves or Gomez or Kino, and you can test from within agents within China and, and see what's going on. And if you're getting 404s or, or 501s or 503, basically uh, these kind of uh, uh, error codes, and then you're pretty sure that uh, you're getting blocked. All right, perfect. We've got a, uh, several questions coming in now. Um, can you – I guess, Jeff, this is probably more for you. Uh, you mentioned it. Um, you talked about the end user experience, actually going and you know testing. Just you know, this is what your your audience is seeing. How do you go about that? What is the process? You literally have people around the country accessing websites. Oh, great question. Okay, so um, what we use is uh, uh, third-party measurement uh, companies. Uh, there's one called Gomez, uh, one called Keynote, and the the one that's specific for China is a company called Network Bench. Um, and we use all those tools. And what they do is they have uh, agents, test agents, all throughout uh, China and actually also on um, end users' PCs. And so uh, a company like, let's say, Disney uh, will go and, and um, say, hey, I want to see wh how my new website's uh, performing. And so someone like Network Bench or Gomez will put in the, um, uh, the website and load it up on all of their little test machines and over a, co a course of a week or two weeks, collect a, a ton of information on how it's performing. And then you get this nice little report that shows you uh, from all these different cities uh, how your website is performing, how, it, you know, is it erroring out, uh, and all of that. Um, and for, uh, you know, uh, customers that come to us, um, we're happy to uh, engage with you since we have access to all these tools to, to set up a test for you. Perfect. Perfect. Uh, this may be – actually, I'll throw this out to both of you, uh, or may, maybe – well, I'll throw it out to both of you. Um, question from uh, the audience here. The, uh, you talked about, obviously, setting an e-commerce site. Uh, China now has got several great tools, Alibaba, Tabo. What, what's the thought of working with them, competing with them, cooperating? Um, what role do local kind of ch Chinese e-commerce sites play into one's uh, – business outreach in China. Jeff, want me to start with this one? I think that's yeah, falls completely in your uh, your camp there. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so it's it's pretty interesting to see. I mean, if you think about the Alibaba group, the Alibaba platforms, Tmall and Taobao being the e-commerce behemoths and kind of the equivalent of the eBay and Amazons of the US, you think about how retailers in the US are actually quite hesitant to do business with Amazon for fear of channel distribution issues or whatever it might be. But you see that in China, businesses, whether they're local, whether they're international, are very excited and optimistic about doing business with both team, with Tmall. Taobao isn't a platform that international businesses are thinking about as much. It's primarily a consumer-to-consumer -consumer platform. It's more of an auction-type site. But when it comes to working with Tmall, they're very interested in using it. 
Um, of course, that's not the case across all sectors. You see luxury players specifically being very reluctant to sell on Tmall just because it tends to be more um, of an attraction for a discount-oriented shopper. But it's something that local and interna international brands alike are consider a must-have e-commerce functionality when selling online in China. A lot of brands, international brands, will actually take a multi platform approach. So they'll have their direct-to-consumer site, they'll have maybe a marketing informational site that's hosted um, within China that isn't transactional, they'll have a branded marketplace store on Amazon.cn, through Tmall, through an, a, few, a number of other um, local players like a JD.com. It's actually one of the nuances of China, which is just the importance of selling on a, a third-party marketplace. Perfect. All right. Uh, we're just coming almost to the top of the hour. Let's try to get in uh, two more questions here. Uh, Jeff, this is for you. Uh, a bit of a technical question uh, regarding time lags. You know, it was mentioned that one object on a site uh, could take 500 milliseconds to uh, process. Can, can you say what the, the, tef the technical definition of an object? What is an object? Okay, that's probably a. It could be a very trick question from a, a strong engineering person, but I'll ignore that. that it's it, the, the technical definition is uh, it's a specific URI or a universal resource uh, uh, indicator. It's it's, a, it's, a, it's just a single j uh, object, a, a JPEG, a GIF, uh, a, uh, you know, mm -hmm. a, a single URL uh, object. Um, within that page, and typically you have your base page, which is your you know your HTML or PHP or whatever uh, base page you have, and then the individual objects. And uh, these days, I'll, I will tell you because of the rich media and all the stuff that's going on, the the number of objects on a page uh, have gone up quite a bit, and it's not. Uh, 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 abnormal for you to go to a, a page and have 50 or 60 uh, objects uh, on a specific page. Interesting. Yeah, exactly. Um, I know here that's always an ongoing <laughs> discussion about how much uh, rich content or interesting content to put on our uh, various web platforms. All right, uh, one final question uh, for Kellen. We'll finish out. Uh, since you're in Singapore, since you're the farthest away, we'll give you the final question. Um, can you chat a little bit about just marketing overall in terms of uh, kind of online engagement, advertising, and uh, kind of best practices? Obviously, having a very uh, quick website seems to be important, but what other steps should pe people think about when they do e-commerce, and uh, what are some of the key measurements that you would uh, – suggest people use to see if they're succeeding or failing? I, th I think that um, it kind of depends at what stage of retail development or general business development any brand is when it comes to being online in China. But if you think about some of the best marketing practices in the U.S., in some ways they're actually transferable to China. So, you know, having a significant social media presence in China is really significant. That said, you're not going to be marketing on Facebook, but you're going to be marketing on a platform like Sino Weibo or WeChat, which is this um, really popular messaging, a mobile messaging application in China that allows brands to target a large number of users through a social, through a message, um, an instant message. It's very similar to WhatsApp, if you aren't familiar with the messaging platform. Again, it's called WeChat. I strongly suggest that any business thinking about operating in China looks into. Um, when it comes to marketing on the web, though, like I mentioned, there are a number of social, social media platforms that are absolutely necessary. And you see that even brands that aren't interested in being transactional immediately are using a, a, a branded website, so a brand.com website, as a way to just educate consumers on their products, their store locations. Um, the history of the brand. And something that's really popular right now is this online to offline channel. So even a brand like Cold Stone or a haagen which can't necessarily um, fulfill an e-commerce order, but what they're doing is they're selling these vouchers through their website or they're offering coupons or codes through their website that can then be redeemed in store. So something to think about for some of those big businesses that whether it's the hospitality industry and you have a large number of 
um, properties in China or it's a retail industry and you have a large number of brick and mortar outlets like a Nike, for example, you've got to think about how to incorporate your marketing both online and in store. All right, a lot of great information. Uh, we're just coming up on uh, 60 minutes. Uh, I want to thank everybody for attending today's session. Uh, I especially want to thank CD Networks for sponsoring this China Business Review webinar. I think it was a very productive session. I also want to thank, obviously, our speakers, Kellen Willis and uh, Jeff Kim, for offering their insight and expertise. Thank you very much. Have a great day.